In this section of the course, I will cover all of the interface parts, especially the core interface parts that are used in every modeling project. I'll go over how the interface is laid out, and we'll look at how to make objects, view them, apply operations to them, and how to make selections and manipulate objects. And last, we'll set up a few keyboard shortcuts so that we can become more proficient at making selections and changing objects. Okay, so here it is. This is Hexagon's interface. It looks simple and familiar. I mean, it has icons and tabs and panels. And watch, I can make most of that go away pressing one key so I can focus on my work. It's fairly easy to understand, and I can break it down like this. Selection Tools, Option Palette, Object Tree, Utilities. The interface is divided into these 10 core areas. At the top are some menu items that give us access to everything. This area here is our manipulator section, and it lets us choose and see which manipulator is active. This area gives us selection options and also shows what selection option is active. This is our core set of tools arranged into tabs. We have our primitives, our vertex modeling tools, lines or spline tools, surface tools, various utilities and modifiers, the UV, paint, and sculpting tools, and then the final tab is a place for you to put your favorite or most used tools. The set of tools below are things we'll cover later in the course. For now, you can click the panel arrow to hide those. Click it again to bring our main toolbar back. I can click on this little arrow off to the side of the window to open the materials palette. On the left and right, we have our work panels. And in the center is our main work view. This panel lets us make object materials and define shading domains. We don't need that now, so we can use the arrow on the side of the panel to hide it again. The panel on the right displays an object's properties, and when an object is selected, we can make alterations to it using this panel. This is also where tool options will display. Below that, we have the scene tree. That is similar to the layer palette you see in other applications. It allows us to organize and group our objects in the scene. This area shows which objects have dynamic options. And finally, this bottom area is our utility bar. It lets us split the screen, like so. Here are some grid and snap to grid options. Next, we have view options here. For instance, I can frame all in view. And here I can select a view pivot point, like this. And in the center of the utility bar are tools for rotating, panning, and zooming the scene. When I press and hold, and then move the mouse, it changes our angle of view. But we'll see later there's a better way of controlling that. This area here gives us the ability to change how the object is rendered or shaded. The two main ones we'll use in this course are the flat solid and the smooth solid options. And there are several different lighting options. Some are pretty crazy, but if one helps you to see the object better, definitely use it. We'll be using the two at the bottom here the most in this course. And here we can apply some basic shadows. But uh, if you have that on, some selection options disappear. So let's turn that off for now. Here, this set lets us hide and select surfaces. This icon lets us turn an object transparent, and that's so that we can see all of the sides of it better. And then here we have a toggle for orthographic view. Then finally here are some rendering options. Uh, ambient occlusion rendering in Hexagon isn't supported on the Mac, but it works on the PC. But like I said before, we don't render in Hexagon anyway. Instead we send our model to DAS for rendering. And then uh, this camera icon here allows us to take a snapshot of whatever is in view and then save it to desktop. At the top of the interface, we have our usual application section that houses every single tool and command. Under File, that's where we save, import, and export, and do all that stuff. Under Edit, we have our usual copy and paste stuff. Uh, side note here, the delete function is 
actually the delete key on your numeric keyboard. If you don't have one, that's okay. We can use the command X to delete instead. Under view, we have different ways at looking at the scene here in the middle. Under display, here is a collection of options for how things look in the scene. Like here, I can turn off the grid uh, that you see here in the viewport. So let's take a better look at these, starting with the top part of the interface. In a way, the interface is organized in order of importance and workflow, with the top left being tools you make selections with. Then here are tools for making and manipulating objects. Then, the panels help us organize objects and change the behavior of the tools we use. And I'll go over all of this in much more detail, and in fact, I'll cover every piece you see here, and I'll go over what they do. But this first scene here, the manipulators, are hard to explain without having something in the perspective view first. So, uh, if you are following along, let's put our first object in the view. Here you'll see uh, this tab for 3D primitives, showing these various shapes we can use. And what are primitives? Uh, they are the building blocks of a model. And by using multiple primitives, you can create a basic model. As we'll learn later, that's certainly not the only way to make a model, and it's actually not the best way. Okay, click and hold and drag the cube icon here, and drag the cube to the viewport below. Now looking over here, here are some options under our Properties panel. I'll go over this panel more later, but here you can increase the tessellation number. And as you increase the number, the cube will divide into even segments. You can also use the arrows here to do the job, or just type 4 and press return. Now press return one more time to complete the job. There, we just made our first shape and applied an operation to it. Now you see, I could have just dragged the cube out and clicked off of it, and that would be fine, but what I wanted to demonstrate is that some of these tools require you to provide some feedback and then press return to finish the job. That is to validate the operation. That's going to be a very common thing in our workflow. Okay, let's do the same for the sphere. Let's drag out the sphere and we see no tessellation options. Why? Just a basic sphere. Well, the thing is, you usually don't actually drag out the icons from the interface. That's not the normal way to make a primitive shape, but it's the quickest way for some of them, especially the cube. Normally, what we do instead is this. Click on the icon, like so, and then you'll see a sort of line structure that acts like a cursor. With the first click, it starts the shape. We then move the cursor to set the size. And with the second click, it confirms the size. Now we haven't pressed return yet, so we have some options here to choose. Let's play with those before validating the shape. You can change the origin of the first click. You can change the type of sphere, number of points, segments, or tessellation. And then back to a pole-based sphere, uh, we can change the coefficients uh, to make it something that doesn't resemble a sphere anymore, but is a pretty interesting shape on its own, like so. Okay, now let's press return to validate. And that's our shape. It's finished. Now before we go any further with shape making, we need to quickly go over how to look around the shapes we make. By holding the Alt Option key down, and within the perspective view, hold the left mouse button down. I then move the mouse left or right, up or down. This is how we commonly look around the objects we make. So why do I need to hold the Option key down to do that? It's a pretty common thing in most 3D apps. If I didn't hold the Option key down, then I could end up moving the shape, like this. But with the Option key down, I can hover over the shape and rotate around it. Okay, let's try some more things. By holding the Option key down uh, and with the right mouse button, move the mouse. We are now panning, like so. And 
Then with the option key down with the middle mouse button, you can zoom in and out. In most 3D applications, doing these things is referred to as camera movement. And they actually have cameras in the scene. In Hexagon, there is no physical representation of a camera, so the metaphor doesn't apply. In other words, there's no actual camera for me to modify the settings of. Instead, we just look through the viewports. The perspective view is the main viewport, but we can look at our work from many different angles. Clicking on the perspective view label, you can see here we have the front, rear, bottom and top views, and so on. We'll be using those views more in our future projects. Another important view is orthographic. We can toggle the orthographic view by clicking here. It's not part of the normal view list because in a way it works like the perspective view, but in a more strict orientation. It's really helpful for quickly snapping to look at something straight on, so you can see and align objects perpendicularly. Let's go back to perspective view. By the way, if you accidentally pan too far off to one side or zoomed out too much to where you can't see anything anymore, click this little button here and that will bring everything back to view. Now that we know how to make some shapes and move around the work view, we can go over the different selection modes. Each of these buttons indicate a different mode. When it is pressed, it stays selected until you choose a different mode. Alright, so let's try them out. The first one here is the basic translation manipulator. And also here we can see the object selection is active. And with that we can choose an entire object. And we'll go over all of the other selection modes off to the side here. But those let us choose parts of an object. Now before we move forward, I want to remove the cube so that we can focus on the sphere. Deleting an object is easy. Inside the view, select the cube, then press the delete key. This is something to remember. To delete an entire object, you need to be in the object selection mode. Also, anytime you want to deselect an object or cancel an operation, press the escape key. Now select the sphere. You'll see around the object there are these arrow things. Now you saw that we can move a shape by just dragging it around, but you can also drag and pull on these arrows to move the shape like this. And that's helpful because it moves in an absolute straight line in that direction. You can also pull on the handle here to move the object on its axis plane in a more freeform fashion. Each arrow represents an axis. The red is the x-axis, the green is the y, and the blue is the Z. You can also see that represented here in the corner. Right now we are using the basic translate manipulator, but let's cycle through the others to see what happens. Rotation manipulator lets us rotate, scale manipulator lets us scale, and the universal manipulator lets us do all three combined. Next to all of those you'll see the ghost icon. All that does is hide the manipulator handles, like this, and that's handy because there are times when the handles just get in the way of what you're working on. You can press the space bar to toggle those off and on too. By the way, if when you are working and you don't see the handles when you expect to, it's probably because you accidentally press the space bar, as I often do. Now let's look at rotation. With the rotation manipulator, you can pull on these circular handles to rotate the object. And there is also this outer gold ring handle that lets you rotate based on your point of view. Let's press Command Z to undo that. The scale manipulator has a lot of handles to pull on. The yellow handle in the center lets us scale from the center of the object. If you click on the handle on the end of the axis, scaling the object is limited to that axis. If you click on one of the gray cubes on the same plane as the two axes, you can squish the object from that side. Then we have this cage that surrounds the object. Push or pull on the side of the box to scale the object from that side. It, you can push inward and go completely on the other side, but don't do that because it might cause problems later. Push or pull on the edge of the box to scale it down like this. Push or pull on the corner of the box to scale the box completely proportionately away from the opposite corner. Last of the selection manipulators is the universal, 
which combines all of the selection manipulator tools. It's the one we'll use the most because it gives us quick access to movement, rotation, and scale. Now for the object selection tools. The first one allows you to select whole objects. You use it to simply move or delete an object. All the other selections here let you select an element of an object. And that could be a line, a point, or a surface. Now before we dive in and look at what these tools do and how to use them, we need to first talk about how objects in 3D are constructed. Objects in 3D don't actually have mass, they are hollow. And here I can hide parts of an object to show inside. Instead, what makes an object is a collection of vertices. Vertices are points in 3D space, and those points are connected with edges to form a face. We can also call an edge a line and call a face a surface. Different faces can share the same points and then start to form an object like this, using multiple faces to make an overall object. You need at least three points, a triangle, to make a face, and that's called a polygon. The best type of polygon is a quad, made with four edges. Some people avoid using triangles so that their model is more flexible for different purposes. And if needed, they triangulate uh, the object at the end of the modeling process. What all modelers try to avoid is making surfaces that are made with ingons. And that's a face made with five or more edges. Some 3D applications don't accept ingons or can't render an ingon. And they appear as holes or disjointed spikes instead of a surface. Hexagon handles ingons just fine, but if we wanted to transfer our model to another application, like Daz Studio, that's when an ingon may cause problems, and we would have to go back to Hexagon to triangulate it. Don't worry, all of this sounds more complicated than it really is, and I promise as we continue with this course, all of this will make much more sense. The thing to remember now is that we strive to make our objects with quads and avoid or convert our ingons to quads or triangles. Now, different applications draw these shapes using algorithms that curve between points, giving it a smooth appearance. And by the way, if what you see looks like this instead of this, it's because I'm using a flat shaded surface instead of a smooth shaded surface. And you can control that by selecting flat or smooth shades options here. I use these to see how my shape will look with smooth style applied. So I can see how it might look in DAS Studio. When we export our model to DAS, it will automatically have smoothing algorithm applied to it. But we can also turn the smoothing off there too. Smoothing is great because it gives a rounded appearance without using too many polygons. The more polygons you have, the slower your computer will operate. Just something to keep in mind. Now that we know how an object is structured, we can discuss how to select vertices, edges, and faces. Clicking on this icon will allow us to select a face and multiple surfaces, like this. And there are three different ways to select a surface. You can hold the shift key down and select one at a time. And holding the shift key and selecting a face again will deselect it. And by holding the command key, we can select multiple faces, drawing a selection like this. And last, using the control key, you can make a bounding box to capture a selection like this. Now if we look behind the object, we can see that it didn't select all of the surfaces, only the ones that were in view. If we want to select all of the faces of an object, we need to make it transparent so that we can see all of the polygons, front and back. Use this tool here to toggle between transparent mode and solid mode. Now it doesn't actually make an object transparent when it comes to rendering. That's done a different way, and we'll look at that later. No, it's actually a transparent mode so that we can look at the object and understand it better, especially when it comes to selecting faces and edges. In fact, this mode only works when you're selecting a face, edge, or point. Anyway, now we can press control and drag a box selection around the object, and it's selected on all sides. 
Okay, let's turn off transparency by pressing that button again. And as a side note, I can press Command Shift A to deselect all and Command A to select all again. And now that we can select surfaces, we can move them to change how an object looks. We'll be playing around more with moving faces later in this course. But for now, let's stop and look at how we can select edges. Look here and select the Edge Selection tool. As you can see, we can select a line. And by holding Shift, we can select multiple lines. And with the Shift key still held down, we can deselect a line by clicking on it again. And like we saw with the surface selection, I can hold the control key down to draw a box to capture a selection. Holding the shift key and clicking on line after line, we can continue to select around the object. But that's pretty tedious. And there's actually a better way. And that's to loop select. Select at least two lines in the direction you want the selection to be made. Then press this tiny loop button. And you'll see your selection is looped around the object. And by the way, you can make a loop in face selection mode, like this. And a loop will stop when it hits a corner, so it won't loop all the way around in that case. Making selections like this is important because the more selection options we have, the more control we have when it comes to making various shapes. Let's go back to lines and make a ring selection. Like loop, the ring button selects a collection of edges around an object. And that's good for performing different operations, like splitting the ring. The Between button lets us make a selection between two edges. And it can also be used with faces. As a side note, these little buttons next to the Between button are just there to let you change the Control key selection from box type to a more freehand type. Okay, let's select outside of the object to unselect everything. You can also press the Escape key to do the same, but if you do, it will go back to full object selection mode. Now, while we're discussing this row of buttons, I'll demonstrate the paint mode and drag selection mode. What's the difference? This little button here looks like a little paintbrush, and that's going to allow us to paint a selection. And if I hold Shift, I can add to the selection. And if I go back to paint, holding Shift, I can unselect multiple selections. Now, pressing on this tiny arrow button here for drag selection mode, in drag selection mode, I can still paint selections, but I can't paint to unselect. Watch. I would have to unselect the surface one at a time. However, what I could do that I can't do in paint selection mode is press and drag the surface around. It's actually rare that I need to do that, so for now, let's go back to the paint selection mode. All right, now that we have that out of the way, let's move on to the point selection. With point selection, we can select points one at a time, and we can hold shift and paint to add points. Now we can't use loop, ring, or between with points, but we can convert a surface or edge selection like this. Go to the edge selection mode and make a loop. Now let's open the advanced option tool set by going up to the window menu and select normal. Now press this button here to convert the line loop to points. There are several different reasons why we would need to select individual points, and that's best described when it comes to making modeling operations. We'll cover that in upcoming projects. At last, we have the auto select button. And that allows us to quickly select either a point, edge, or face. And it's a little confusing because you double click to switch to line, edge, or point post-click. But like the universal manipulator tool, it's something we'll use a lot because it's going to allow us to quickly access the parts we want. Let's press escape twice to unselect everything and go back to full object selection mode. And then reselect the object. Now press the auto select tool and select a point. Our point is selected and the interface shows us that we're also in auto mode uh, for point selection. You can then double click to switch auto selection, double click on the object anywhere, then click on the surface. We're now auto selecting surfaces. And that's how the auto selection works. So now that we've learned everything about making selections and manipulating objects, it's time to set up our key commands for them. 
go to the top and select edit and then look for the shortcut editor. Click on the tab for tools and then the selection for tools here. Here we'll find all of our settings for selection manipulators. Let's go ahead and set up those now. Hover over the setting for translate manipulator and click on it. Now on the keyboard press W. As we set up keys if you ever see this message pop up just press yes to validate that you want to redefine it. My keys are already set, so that's why we see that. Uh, but you might see it because we're going to override some of the default keys. I use the same key commands in other applications like Silo or Carrera, so that when I go back to use one of those apps, all those key commands match the function. Okay, let's continue with setting this up. Just as you set up the translation manipulator key, let's do the same with the, uh, the rest. Make rotation R. Make scale E and universal Q. Now press the tab for selection and let's set up our keys for selection types. Let's make it F for selecting an object selection, D for face selection, S for edge selection, A for points, and finally G for auto select. And we're done. Press validate to save the keyboard settings. Okay, now our keys are set up like this. This row is for selection manipulators, and this row is for selection types. As we progress in this course, we'll use these keys a lot, so it's important to get used to them now. It's the thing that's going to allow us to work more quickly as modelers. I have a novel way to remember these. When I want to select a full object, I press F, G for getting everything. When I want to select a surface domain, I press D, and a line slice is S and a point is A. R is for rotation, E is for scale, W to move, W is just an upside down M, Q for the quintessential universal tool. Go ahead and practice using these keys to make selections. As you press a key you can see what's going on by just looking at the icons to confirm what mode you are in. In the next segment, we're going to start putting all of this into practice with our first project. But before we do that, we will continue to set up the keyboard shortcuts in the next video, matching them to the shortcut guide that I provided. Look for that under the resources. Uh, doing that will help us to become quicker, more productive modelers.